Brothers and sisters, good evening, and welcome to the first Friday Mass for the month of July. Before we begin the Mass, please join me in praying the Novena to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Divine Jesus, you have said, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Behold us kneeling at your feet, filled with a lively faith and confidence in the promises dictated by your sacred heart and pronounced by your adorable lips. We come to ask this favor. To whom can we turn to if not to you? Whose heart is the source of all graces and merits? Where should we seek if not in the treasure which contains all the richness of your kindness and mercy? Where must we knock if not at the door through which God gives himself to us and through which we go to God? We have recourse to you, heart of Jesus. In you we find consolation when afflicted, protection when persecuted, strength when burdened with trials, and light in doubt and darkness. Dear Jesus, we firmly believe that you can grant us the grace we implore, even though it should require a miracle. You have only to will it, and our prayer will be granted. We admit that we are most unworthy of your favors, but this is not a reason for us to get discouraged. You are the God of mercy, and you will not refuse a contrite heart. Cast upon us a look of mercy, we beg of you, and your kind heart will find in our miseries and weakness a reason for granting our prayer. O Sacred Heart, whatever may be your decision with regard to our request, we will not stop adoring, loving, praising, and serving you. Lord Jesus, be pleased to accept this, our act of perfect resignation to the decrees of your adorable heart, which we sincerely desire may be fulfilled in and by us and all your creatures forever. Sacred Heart of Jesus, we know that there is but one thing impossible to you, to be without pity to those who are suffering or in distress. Look upon us, we beg of you, dear Jesus, and grant us the grace of which we humbly implore you through the immaculate heart of your most sorrowful mother. You have entrusted us to her as her children, and her prayers are all powerful with you. Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening, everyone. In behalf of our brothers and sisters of Cebu area and our host region, Central Cebu, through Cebu North Chapter, I would like to welcome all of you to our first Friday Mass for this month of July. Our Mass presider for tonight is no less than our spiritual advisor, Father Herb Schneider. Let's sing our opening song. Yeah. 
to be my rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord relent and bless to be my rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord relent and bless to be my rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. We begin our celebration in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion in the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And with your spirit. My brothers and sisters, we are in God's holy presence, and we are always in need of his pardon and peace. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, you came to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to save sinners. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You intercede for us at God's right hand. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, who through the grace of adoption chose us to be children of light, grant we pray that we may not be wrapped in darkness of error, but may always stand in the bright light of truth. We ask this to our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And let us listen now to our first reading. The first reading is taken from the book of Genesis. The span of Sarah's life was 127 years. She died in Kiriatharba that is Hebron in the land of Canaan, and Abraham performed the customary morning rites for her. Then he left the side of his dead one and addressed the Hittites. Although I am a resident alien among you, sell me from your holdings a piece of property for a burial ground that I may bury my dead wife. After the transaction, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave of the field of Machpelah, facing Mamre, that is Hebron in the land of Canaan. Abraham had now reached a ripe old age, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. Abraham said to the senior servant of his household, who had charge of all his possessions, Put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not procure a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live but he will go to my own land and to my kindred to get a wife for my son, Isaac. The servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to follow me to this land? Should I take your son to the land from which you migrated? Never take my son back there for any reason, Abraham told him. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house in the land of my kin and who confirmed by oath the promise he had made to me. I will give this land to you, to your descendants. He will send his messenger before you, and you will obtain a wife for my son there. If the woman is unwilling to follow you, you will be released from this oath, but never take my son back there. A long time later, Isaac went to live in the region of Negev. One day toward evening, he went out in the field, and as he looked around, he noticed that camels were approaching. Rebecca, too, was looking about, and when she saw him, she alighted from her camel. She asked the servant, who is this man out there walking through the fields towards us? That is my master, replied the servant. 
Then she covered herself with her veil. The servant recounted to Isaac all the things he had done. Then Isaac took Rebekah into his tent. He married her, and thus she became his wife. In his love for her, Isaac found solace after the death of his mother, Sarah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Responsorial Psalm. Let our response be, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks, Give thanks to, to the, the Lord, Lord, to the Lord for, for he is good. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Who can tell the mighty deeds of the Lord or proclaim all his praises? Response, give thanks, thanks to the, the Lord, Lord, for he is, is good. Blessed are they who observe what is right, who always do what is just. Remember us, O Lord, as you favor your people. Response, give, give thanks, thanks to, to the, the Lord, Lord for, for he is good. good. Visit me with your saving help, that I may see the prosperity of your chosen ones. Rejoice in the joy of your people okay. and glory with your inheritance. Response, give, give thanks, thanks to, the to the Lord for he is good. good. Alleluia, alleluia. Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest, says the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus passed by, passed by, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the customs post. He said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. When he was at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with Jesus and his disciples. The Pharisees saw this and said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? He said to them, uh, those who, who are well to do do not need a physician, but the sick do. Go and learn the meaning of the words, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. In the Gospel of the day, uh, we read about tax collector or maybe a customs official because he was at the customs post in Kafarnaum. And uh, so he was doing his profession. He was, as it were, at his place of work. And our Lord saw him and said, come and follow me. And similar to Simon and Andrew and James and John, Matthew gets up immediately and follows the Lord. And in that sense, becomes an example for us of the kind of response that God expects from those that he calls. And then the story switches to a dinner party in the house of Matthew that he gives in honor of Jesus. And of course, because tax collectors, uh, customs officials, those kind of people were considered to be unrighteous, to be public sinners, and no decent person would associate with them. So it's only natural that all the guests at that party were similar to Matthew, were tax collectors and sinners. So it's a great party of sinners who are reconciled to God and to one another. And in that sense, they're actually a picture, I believe, of what the BCBB should be like. Because when we, what we, evangel, when we are called to evangelize uh, leaders in the marketplace, but not those that are already saved, but we have to reach out to those who have somehow lost their relationship with the Lord, maybe who are drifting as Christians or who do not go to church anymore. And we are supposed to, by our testimony, by our caring for them, 
to reach out and bring them back into that dinner party that the Lord uh, wants in order to celebrate that he reconciles sinners to himself, restores their life, and fills them with joy and happiness. Uh, and that's the mission of the BCDP, I feel, that we look for those business leaders, uh, for those men in, and women in the workplace who have lost direction, who have somehow given up on the Lord, who no longer practice their faith, and to offer them the chance to come back to the Lord, to experience his love, his forgiveness, his restoration. And because of that, our breakfast, our community meetings should be meetings of joy and happiness because we were lost and we have been found. Just like Matthew was lost and was found and became one of the close followers of our Lord and uh, one of the 12, the apostles that the Lord calls. And so let us pray at this mass that the Lord would kind of redirect in a way our evangelism to give us eyes to spot those who need the Lord, uh, who have lost their way, so that we may call them back, show them the way back to the Lord, and lead them into the joyful company of those who were lost and have been found, and who, who know the Lord and have experienced his great love, his great mercy, and his great forgiveness. And so as disciples of the Lord on mission in the marketplace who have been sent to bring the good news to those who have lost the way, uh, let us now bring to the Lord all our intercession, all our prayers, all our needs, and pray that through the intercession of St. Matthew, the Lord would grant them. And let us now bring to the Lord our petitions and let our, our uh, response be, Lord, hear our prayer. May the leaders and ministers of the church trust in the Lord's mercy in their challenging and delicate task of guiding the flock of God. May they be a sign of the primacy of mercy in their pastoral ministry, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Like the tax collector Matthew, may sinners turn their gaze to Jesus and accept his call to work in the building of God's kingdom. We pray. Lord, hear our prayer. May we not focus on our sinful past, but on the Lord's invitation to face the present and the future, trusting his mercy rather than our frail capacities. We pray. Lord, hear our prayer. May you grant us good, all good health, safety, and protection as we combat the, to overcome the virus, this pandemic, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For our BCBP community and its members, that we may continue to grow and be of service, inspiring others and one another in bringing Christ to the marketplace and win the marketplace for Christ, we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray in the silence of our heart, also for our own intentions. God, our Father, we bring to you all of these, our needs, our petitions, and we ask you in your goodness and mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Blessed are you, Lord God, of all creation. Through your goodness, we have received the bread we offer you. Fruit of the earth and work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, to humble himself, to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God, of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer. Through the vine and work of human hands, it will become for us the drink of life. 
Blessed be God forever. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and be pleased with the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. O God, who graciously accomplish the effects of your mysteries, grant we pray that the deeds by which we serve you may be worthy of these sacred gifts. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your heart. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Father most holy, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your Word, through whom you made all things, whom you send as our Savior and Redeemer, incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin, in fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people, he stretched out his hands as he endured his passion, so as to break the bonds of death and manifest the resurrection. And so with all your angels and with all the saints, we declare your glory as with one voice we acclaim. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of hosts, heaven, heaven and earth, earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the Hosanna highest. In the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fond of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we when eat we this bread, bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death. Your death, death until you come. Until you come. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, Onesta, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your faith. Have mercy on us all, we pray that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, as spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, and with all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may marry to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, forever and ever. Amen. And now full of confidence and joy, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. 
our Father, Father who, art who art in heaven, hallowed be, be thy name. name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and graciously grant peace in our day, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, for the, kingdom the power, the, power, glory, the glory, glory are you now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. And let us exchange that peace with one another. Peace be with you. Lamb of, God. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Lord Jesus Christ, with love in your faith and in your mercy, we eat your body and drink, drink your blood. Let it not bring us condemnation, but health in mind and body. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. How happy are we who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I am Lord, not worthy, worthy that you should enter into my roof, but, but only say the word, and, and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ bring us to everlasting life. Amen. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Horatio Imperata Merciful and compassionate Father, we come to you in our need to seek your protection against the COVID-19 virus that has disturbed and even claimed lives. We ask you now to look upon us with love and by your healing hand dispel the fear of sickness and death, restore our hope, and strengthen our faith. We pray that you guide the people tasked to find cures for this disease and to stem its transmission. We thank you for the vaccines developed, made possible by your guiding hands. Bless our efforts to use these vaccines to end the pandemic in our country. We pray for our health workers, that they may minister to the sick with competence and compassion. Grant them health in mind and body, strength in their commitment, protection from the disease. We pray for those afflicted. May they be restored to health. Protect those who care for them. Grant eternal rest to those who have died. Give us the grace in these trying times to work for the good of all and to help those in need. May our concern and compassion for each other see us through this crisis and lead us to conversion and holiness. Grant all these through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. We fly to your protection, O Holy Mother of God. Do not despise our petition in our necessities, but deliver us always from all dangers. O glorious and blessed Virgin, Amen. Our Lady Health of the Sick, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. 
Saint Raphael the Archangel, pray for us. San Roque, pray for us. San Lorenzo Ruiz, pray for us. San Pedro Calungsod, pray for us. Let us pray. May this divine sacrifice we have offered and received fill us with life, O Lord, we pray, so that bound to you in lasting charity, we may be a fruit that lasts forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Eucharist is ended. Let us continue to love and to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Welcome to our fifth session on studying the Gospel of St. Mark. I want to begin again, as usual, uh, with a short recap of session four, what we took up in our last session. The last session focused on Mark 1, verse 14 
to chapter 4, verse 34, which is, as it were, the beginning part of Jesus' public ministry. And there are two things that are brought out, especially in that section. And the first one is that the reputation of Jesus grows. After he uh, heals a man possessed by an unclean spirit in the synagogue of Capernaum, uh, where it says at the end that his reputation began to spread through the neighboring region, it spreads all the way to chapter 4 to such big crowds gathering around him that Jesus actually has to take a boat and make it his pulpit. So he sits on the boat on the water by the shore and the crowd is on land listening to him. So there's a tremendous spread of responsibility, of, of reputation. But then also, uh, at the same time, opposition to Jesus also grows. And it begins in chapter 2, when Jesus forgives the sins of a paralyzed man. And the scribes sitting there think, think in his heart, they don't express it, but they think it, that he is committing blasphemy because who can forgive sins but God alone and uh, Jesus is aware of them and tries to correct it and then after that he eats he calls Levi in the, in the gospel of Mark today in at the mass at the first Friday mass in the gospel of Matthew he's called Matthew okay so in the house of Levi <coughs> he eats with other tax collectors and sinners and the scribes of the Pharisees complained to the disciples. They said, he's your teacher. Now he's supposed to give a good example. And he associates with people. No decent person associates with. So this time it's not silent in their heart. But it's expressed not directly to Jesus, but to those who, are, who go with him. And then uh, the next thing is they go through a grain field. And the disciples pluck the heads of grain and rub it in their hand to get the kernels out of it and eat it. And the Pharisees accuse them to Jesus directly. They say, look at your disciples. Don't you pay any attention to them. They're doing what is not allowed on the Sabbath. So you're condoning, as it were, their breaking of the Sabbath regulations. And Jesus, again, has to defend his disciples. And then at, in chapter 3, uh, in a synagogue, the man with the withered hand, when he heals him without breaking the Sabbath, the Pharisees and the Herodians plot together how they might destroy him. And then in chapter 3, later on, the scribes coming from Jerusalem think that he is possessed by Beelzebub. And both together with his relatives and friends from Nazareth think that he is crazy, which means he's possessed by an unclean spirit. And the result of those responses to Jesus divides people into, into two groups. Those who accept the revelation of Jesus, who are open to his word, to his ministry, who follow him, who are blessed by it, who are reconciled to God by it. And another group that is close to him and who become outsiders. They hear everything else that Jesus is saying but they no longer understand it because their heart and their mind have given the wrong interpretation. They think he's possessed. He's a person with demonic powers. And so, obviously, they, they hear, but they don't really understand anymore. So that's kind of the result at the end of chapter 4. Now, one other important point, which actually I didn't mention, uh, in, in our uh, last, last session is that when Jesus defends himself against the scribes from Jerusalem who accuse him of being possessed by Beelzebub, he basically describes himself as the divine warrior, as someone sent by God to overcome the devil, to defeat the devil, to tie him up, the strong man and then to despoil the devil of all his captives. And the devil's captives, in a way, are those 
who are possessed, obviously, but also those who are enslaved by sin and, and who are sick, who cannot be cured. In other words, he's sent to fight all the powers and forces that are against life and well-being and restore people not only to friendship with God, but to wholeness of life. So Jesus is depicted in these chapters also as the divine warrior. And so with this now, we move to, to study together, to look together at the next section of the Gospel of Mark, starting with uh, chapter 4, verse 35, and going all the way up to chapter 8, verse 30, where Jesus in 27, 8, 27 to 30, where Jesus near Caesarea Philippi asked the disciples, who do people, and then who do you say that I am? Okay. Now, one of the things that characterizes that whole section is that Jesus ministers on both sides of the lake. Now, the significance of that is that, if, that on the western side, the side that faces the Mediterranean, uh, that's the Jewish side. But if you cross the lake to and from Bethsaida uh, uh, East, you enter the territory of Decapolis. Polis in Greek means city, Deca means ten. So it's the area of the ten Gentile cities. The eastern side of the lake is inhabited primarily by non-Jews, by Gentiles, by pagans. And so by ministering on both sides of the lake, Jesus ministers to both Jews and Gentiles. And also in this section, he trains his disciples to minister to a community made up of Jews and Gentiles. Now, one great way of seeing the structure of that section is kind of like uh, representing graphically what Jesus does on the eastern side and then what he does on the, on the western side, and so forth, you know, and, and seeing the, the crossings of the lake in between. So that's what we want to look at. And so in chapter 4, verse 34, because the, that ended last, the last session, we are in a, on the western side, the Jewish side of the lake. And then Jesus says in verse 34 to his disciples, let us cross over to the other side. And then we read, leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them just as he was in the boat, and other boats were with him. So, but we never hear of the other boats. They're not any further described. So a couple of boats set out with Jesus in one of them to cross the lake now to the Gentile side. And the first episode, which goes to the end of chapter 4, is the storm on the lake, the storm at sea. Now, that is something we're going to see in, in, with variations again and again. Whenever Jesus crosses with his disciples from the western side, the Jewish side, to the eastern side, there's always some, uh, some difficulty. In this case, a storm. At other crossings, a headwind. And in the final crossing, the trouble is in the boat itself. So whenever they cross to the Gentile side, there is opposition to Jesus' coming. Apparently, the forces that control that area want to keep their control. And they oppose the in, inroad of the gospel of the good news that is brought by Jesus Christ about the kingdom of God. And But whenever the boat crosses back to the Jewish side, it's always smooth sailing. There's no storm. There's no difficulty. It's totally uneventful journey. So what we want to do now is simply look at three incredible miracles of Jesus. One, about the crossing, and then the first, the, the, the cure of the demoniac on the Gentile side, and then two miracles on the Jewish side, the healing of the woman with the flow of blood and the raising from the dead of the daughter of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. So the first 
uh, story, Jesus crosses with the disciples in the boat to the other side. And then we read a, a, a windstorm broke out and the waves beat into the boat and the boat was being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And so the disciples wake him up and they say to him, teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? And then it says, Jesus woke up and he rebuked the wind. And he said to the sea, peace, be still. And the dead calm ensued. The wind died down and the sea became calm. And then Jesus turns to the disciples and says, why are you afraid? You know, or an even better, more graphic translation would be, why are you such cowards? You know? uh, and then he says, don't you have any faith yet? Or don't you yet have any faith? You know? But they are filled with awe, naturally speaking. They're filled with awe. And they say to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the waves obey him? And in this first miracle, this most powerful sign uh, done by, the, by Jesus, he shows himself the master, not just of the forces of nature, but the chaotic forces of nature, the destructive forces of nature, like the storm at sea that was set to destroy the boat and, of course, all those in the boat together with it. So Jesus here is Lord of nature now and, and his his divinity in a way shines through in this most powerful word and it's natural that the disciples would be filled with awe and would say to one another would ask one another who can this person be no. because again don't forget they don't have the information we got in the prologue we know that jesus is the messiah we also know that he is the son of god we know that he bears the divine name, you know, which we all found out in, in, one chap, in chapter 1, verse 1 to 13. And then he's anointed with the power of God's spirit, and it's God's son, with whom God is well pleased. So we, what all that means comes through in that first section, distilling of the storm. So, so notice, you notice again, there's violent objection to the boat reaching the eastern side. Now, once, and it says them that they cross to the other side and reach the territory of the Gerasenes. Okay. Now, as soon as Jesus comes out of the steps, out of the boat, it says he's met by a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit. And then it describes the man and it says of him, uh, he, who could no longer be, he lived among the tombs, could no longer be restrained. He had often been restrained with chains and fetters, but the chains he had wrenched the thunder and the fetters he had broken to pieces. And now no one had the strength to subdue him. And among the tombs and on the tops of the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. Now here you have somebody who is, you know, totally possessed by evil. First of all, he lives among the tombs, so he's totally impure, ritually speaking. Anybody who has contact with the dead could no longer worship God. He had to be purified first. Now, we know that, for example, in the story of the Good Samaritan, when the priest and Levi uh, pass by the, the man who fell among the robbers, because probably they think he's dead. And they know that if they touched him or came in contact with him, they would have to go through a ritual of purification. Okay, so this guy lives among the dead. So he's as ritually impure, defiled, unfit for, for the company of, of the righteous ones, of God's followers, and of God himself. But then it's not only that. He's possessed by a superhuman strength so that he can just, you know, break chains and fetters and that no pe people are simply not capable of subduing him but then the irrationality that force that has taken possession of him comes out 
in that, you know, he, he howls among the tombs like an animal. And even just like a, like a frightened, uh, frightful animal. So he howls. And then he, he, he bruises himself with stones. A little bit like the, the, the priests of Baal uh, on Mount Carmel, you know, under, under Elijah. So, so we, we have something here that's really an image of evil. And it, in a way, becomes a symbolic presentation of what the land is like where, you know, of, of the pagan land, where, which is under the subject of, of demons and of gods that aren't really gods, of forces that are against, against the Lord. So, and when this person now sees Jesus from a distance, he runs up. And again, you notice there's something seriously wrong with him because he bows down before Jesus and shouts at the top of his voice, what have you got to do with us, Jesus, son of the most high God? Now, he knows him. And he says, don't torment us. Because Jesus had been saying, come out of the man, your unclean spirit. I mean, Jesus asks his name. He, he says to him, my name is Legion because we are many. And then they beg Jesus not to drive them out of the country. But on the hillside, it's a herd of swine. And the unclean spirits beg Jesus to let them leave the man, but to enter the swine. And Jesus gives permission. And so they, they come out of the man. They enter this herd of, 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 of pigs, 2,000 of them. And the pigs become possessed, possessed by legion. And they stampede down a steep bank into the lake and are drowned. In other words, they commit suicide, so to speak. Uh, but again, put your Jewish thinking caps on. Look at this as a Jew would read it. You know, and pork, the pigs defile the land. They're unclean animals. And there are so many of them. So when Jesus comes to the eastern side, it's a land under the dominance of demons and ritually impure because also of the pigs on the mountainside. And when Jesus drives out this, this unclean spirit from the man, and when the pigs stampede into the lake and are drowned, in a sense, the land is cleansed and prepared for the coming of the good news. Now we are supposed to see all of that. So when the man at the end begs Jesus, because the, the people come and they beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood, so Jesus gets back in the boat to go back to the Jewish side. And then the man who had been possessed runs up and he says to Jesus, you know, uh, he begs him to remain with him, to go with Jesus. But Jesus refuses. He says, go back to your friends. Tell them what God has done for you, what mercy he has shown you. And then we read in the story that he went back and he proclaimed all through the Decapolis, through this Gentile area, what Jesus had done for him. And all who heard it were amazed. And so the good news comes to pagan territory in spite of great opposition. And the first thing that happens is that the land itself is cleansed. The unclean spirits are driven out. And together with the pigs are destroyed in the lake. And the lake itself, I mean water, the sea itself, is in the Bible also a symbol for the abyss. In other words, the place um, um, where that's, that's just right for evil spirits. So basically, by the pigs drowning in the lake, it also means that these evil spirits are sent back to hell. Okay. So that's the beginning of this section. It shows us Jesus equipped with divine power, you know, stronger than the strongest evil, a man that couldn't be subdued by anyone anymore. Jesus subdues with the word. You now, and when the people come actually to kind of like find out what happened, they see this person who had been possessed by legion sitting there fully clothed in his right mind. And it says they were afraid well, because it's, it's, they were confronted with, with the vine itself. Okay, 
Now notice, let me get back to my crossing. So they cross over to the Jewish side and notice it's just one verse. It says, and they crossed over in the boat, you know, and then a crowd gathers around him. So there's no headwind, there's no opposition, there's no difficulty. But when the crowd gathers around him, an official, a leader from the synagogue comes, and when he sees Jesus, he begs him repeatedly and says to him, my daughter, my little girl, is at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her that she may live and not die. And Jesus goes with him. And the crowd follows, pressing in on him. Um, and there's a woman in the place. And this woman had been suffering for 12 years of hemorrhages. And she had suffered a lot from doctors, you know, from all the various prescription or healing rituals they prescribe. And she had spent all her money and didn't get better but worse. Oh, by the way, let me interrupt for a moment. I hope all you, my brothers and sisters, have the scriptures open. So you're not just listening to me, but you see that I'm really following the text. So on your phone, on your iPad, or the book, please open to the Gospel of Mark, to chapter 5, verse 1. That's the section, the, the first section that we are now getting into. Uh, and so this woman, uh, you know, had heard about Jesus. And so she comes up behind him in the crowd. And she reaches out and she touches his cloak. Because she says to herself, if I only touch his clothes, I shall be healed. And so immediately it says, the hemorrhage dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed. But now the amazing thing is that Jesus also immediately feels power going out of him. And he turns around in that crowd and he says, who touched my clothes? And the apostles, I mean, are amazed. They just say to him, how can you say who touched you? Look at this crowd. Everybody is chastling around you. And you say who touched you. But Jesus knew what happened and he's looking around for the person who did it. And then the woman comes and confesses. And Jesus says to her, go in peace and be healed of your ailment because her faith has healed her. Okay. And at that moment, while he's still speaking, people come from the synagogue leader's house and say to him, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher any further? Now Jesus says to the man, do not be afraid, just have faith. And then he doesn't let the crowd come with him anymore. He dismisses the crowd. But he takes with him only uh, Simon, Peter, uh, James, and John, the Zebedee brothers. And as they approach the house of the leader, they notice a commotion. There are people weeping and wailing and you know making lots of noise. And as he enters the house, he says to him, why are you making all this commotion? You know, the girl isn't dead, she's asleep. And their response is, they laugh at him. And then he puts them all out. And he only allows the father and the mother, of course, and his three companions to go with him to where the girl is. And he takes her by the hand. And he says to her, Talitha Kum, little girl, get up. And the girl gets up and she begins to walk around. And then we find out that she's about 12 years old. Now, of course, we can imagine how his three disciples and the parents feel at that, how astounded they are, how, you know, how amazed they are. But Jesus says to them, no one must know about this. And then he tells them, you know, to get their mind away from all of this a little bit. He tells them, go give her something to eat. All right, what we've just witnessed is two incredible miracles. The, the first one, the woman with the flow of blood. Jesus can bring healing where human science, doctors, medicine fails. Even apparently incurable illness. 
can be cured by Jesus, by the power that is within him, which is, which is the life of God himself. And so when she touches his cloak in faith, that, that life flows over to her. And what no doctor was able to accomplish, the life force of Jesus does. And so again, we have a glimpse of someone, you know, who is filled with divine power and with great love and great mercy so that, you know, this woman is healed after 12 years of suffering from an ailment that looked like she would have to bear it till the end of her life. And then the final one is Jesus is master even of death. Even death has to relinquish its victims. And notice there's no struggle, there's, there's nothing. It just takes the girl by the hand and says, get up. And life is restored and she gets up and she walks and, you know, is hungry again and so forth. And is restored to full health. And so in, in, in this section, in those three miracles, the one on the Gentile side and the, on the crossing to the Gentile side, and then the miracle on the Jewish side, we have Jesus, master of virulent evil, demonic evil. We have Jesus, master of incurable illness and master even of death. And so I think it is right for us to ask the same question that the disciples in the boat asked. Who can this man be that even the wind and the waves and the forces from hell obey him and are subject to him? Who can this man be that incurable illness gets healed as if it were not, as if there were nothing to it? And that even death has to give up its victims. I said in the earlier section uh, that uh, in chapter 3, Jesus says, no one can plunder a strong man's house unless he first ties up the strong man. And then indeed his possessions may be plundered. Think of that as an image of who Jesus is. Jesus is that stronger man who ties up the devil. And plunders is in the process of plundering, that is, of setting free all the captives of the devil, whether that is by sickness or whether that is by enslavement to sin or whether that are the forces of hell themselves. And even death has to give up its victims. And behind it, of course, is always the question, what will our response be to Jesus who manifests himself, who he is to us? in these stories. With that, we move into chapter 6. Chapter 6 begins by Jesus leaving the place where uh, Kafaina Omer, this, this, these miracles took place, and he goes to, to Nazareth, his hometown. And all something happens that I think can happen very often, that, you know, you may be a great man to everyone else, but to, to your family, you're nothing special. And so Jesus goes to Nazareth and teaches in the synagogue. And they're absolutely amazed at the wisdom he has and about the deeds of power that he has done that he had heard about. But then they begin to think this way. But isn't that the carpenter? No, in other words, the son of Joseph who had a carpenter shop in our midst? No. Isn't he the son of Mary, the brother of uh, James and Joseph and, and Judas, Jude and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? I mean, we know that guy. He's one of us. No, there can't be anything special about him. And so they take offense at him. What's, what's all this pretense of being something special? So that Jesus says, expresses it and says, you know, no Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, among their own kin, and in their own, in their own house, you know, with their own family members. And the effect is, he cannot do any deed of power there. I mean, there's just no opportunity to kind of like to 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 minister to them. 
except it says that he laid his hands on a few who were sick and cured them. And he was absolutely amazed at their unbelief. Okay. After this, the ministry again, we have to think expands in Galilee. And so finally, uh, Jesus does something that he initiated in chapter 3. In chapter 3, he appointed 12, who we called apostles, to be with him and to be sent out on mission. <clears throat> and so he now calls those, those 12, and begins to send them out two by two. And he gives them power over unclean spirits. So these are apostles who are now assisting Jesus in spreading the good news, get the same power to make the kingdom of God present by driving out evil spirits, by curing illness, by doing exactly the deeds of power that Jesus does. But Jesus also wants them to be totally dependent on God like he is. And so he tells them how they are supposed to do their missionary journey. So he first of all says, take nothing with you except a staff, you know, to help you walking and maybe to defend you against a loose dog. Okay. And he said, then he spells it out. No bread, no bag, no money in your belt, in your wallet, you know, and, but wear sandals. And, and finally, he says to them, don't put on a second tunic. In other words, don't take extra clothes or anything with you. And, and then he also tells them, any house that you enter, stay there for the, for the length of your, of your stay in that place. And one of the reasons is, I think Jesus knew that, you know, you go to one house and the fare there is a little bit poor, but there's another house that also would like to have you and you have better food, you know, better seafood or whatever it may be. Uh, yeah, you might want to transfer, but Jesus says the house you go into, that's the house you stay. And then they're supposed to shake off the dust of their feet in testimony against places that would not receive them and reject them. And then it says the disciples went out and they did exactly what Jesus did. They preached that all should repent. Remember Jesus' proclamation in 14 and 15, where he says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom is at hand, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And here we read, they went out and they proclaimed the good news, preaching that all should repent. And they drove out demons and they anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. And we get an interlude again of danger. King Herod hears of Jesus. You know, and, and the people believe all kinds of things of who Jesus is, a little bit in anticipation of chapter 8. Herod believes, when he hears about Jesus and his miracles, he believes it's John the Baptist come back to life again, whom Herod beheaded. And we actually have the story then of how that came about. Uh, namely, especially through the wife of his brother Philip, Herodias, whom Herod had married. And because John had opposed that union, saying it was unlawful, she had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. And then uses the occasion of the birthday party and the dance of the daughter of Herod to get her wish and have, has John murdered in prison. After that, the disciples come back and they tell Jesus everything they taught and did. And then Jesus says to them, let us go to a deserted place and rest for a while. And the reason is that so many people were coming and going that they had no time even to eat. That's the second time we hear about that. Because the first time was in chapter 3, where Jesus was so busy he had no time to eat. And then his family sets out to get him because people were saying he's out of his mind. Okay, here he wants his disciples and himself to go to a quiet place, have a bit of rest, and debrief them. But when they get to the place, which they thought was a deserted place, the people who had seen them leave knew where they were going, and they rushed there on foot and got there ahead of him. And then when Jesus sees them, he's moved with pity. 
for they are like sheep without a shepherd. And he begins to teach them many things. Now, here's a very important lesson for his disciples to learn and for us too. Now, yes, we do need from time to time uh, a time off, a time to recoup, a time to, recre re to be recreated, to be refreshed and strengthened. But on the other hand, you know, when Jesus sees the great need of the crowd, who have no leaders and no one to take care of them. Now, he knows that this is not the time to take the rest. So for the sake of the need of the crowd, of the people, he's willing to put aside his own comfort, no, his, his own needs, and even that of his disciples. And I think it's through this example that he, you know, forgets about this being a time, uh, a time for rest and solitude, it's about that and teaches them is a great lesson for the disciples. The first lesson that they need to learn if they want to take care of the people of God, not to be willing to sacrifice themselves for the good of God's people, as Jesus is showing them by his example. And then uh, the hour is late. It's a deserted place. The disciples come and Tell Jesus, you know, it's getting late. Let the people go so they may go to the surrounding countryside and buy themselves something to eat. And then Jesus says to them, you give them something to eat. In other words, don't send the crowd away. Take care of them. Now, in this whole passage now of the multiplication of loaves and fish, Jesus is teaching his disciples to care for Jewish people because they're on the Jewish side. Okay. But the disciples kind of like say, I mean, are we supposed to go out and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them? And that would be like the annual wage, the annual income of a day laborer, more or less. No. But Jesus says to them, how many loaves do you have? Go find out. No. Find out the resources you actually have. And then come back and they report that there are five loaves and two fish. And then Jesus again tells them, go have the crowd sit down on the grass, on the green grass. And so the disciples organized the crowd in groups of hundreds and fifties. And then Jesus says the prayer over the bread and over the fish. And then he divides the bread, gives it to the disciples, said, okay, now take it and distribute it to the crowd, serve the people. And it says the disciples did that, they served the people. And then Jesus gave them the fish. And they also distributed the fish. And then we hear of the miracle that they all ate. They all were filled. And then the disciples following Jewish custom that nothing would go to waste, pick up the leftover pieces of the bread and the fish, and they collect 12 baskets full. And, and then Jesus immediately, then he, you know, we feared that, these were 5,000 men who ate, not counting women and children, but 5,000 men. And then Jesus sends the disciples across the lake to the other side uh, while he dismisses the crowd. And then after he says goodbye to them, he goes to the mountain and he prays. That's the second time we hear that Jesus spent time in prayer, not alone by himself. The first after the healings and exorcisms in front of the door of Peter's house in chapter one, where very early in the morning he gets up and prays. And now here we hear after the crowd is gone, he goes to the mountain and prays. And when evening comes, the boat is out at sea and he is on the land. But when he looks towards the boat, he sees his disciples are struggling at the oars against an adverse wind. Notice what I said, wherever they go east in any direction, you know, there's adversity, and this time it's not a storm, but it's, it's a headwind, so that they hardly make any progress. And so Jesus, in early morning, comes to them walking on the sea. Now, uh, obviously, the disciples think it's a ghost and are frightened. And then Jesus talks to them and says, do not be afraid, it is I. He identifies himself. And he gets into the boat. And as soon as he gets in the boat, 
the wind dies down. Now the adversary is gone. And it, it's very often that way also you know, in, in the church that uh, in the Bible of Peter, if I can speak that way on the boat, is that there's storms blow up and everything else. But if Jesus is with us, we do not have to be afraid. No, we, we will reach our destination. Uh, in fact, in, in, in the Gospel of John, as soon as Jesus is in the boat, they have already arrived where they were going. No. So he brings that, that idea out as well. All right. So now notice the last sentence, please, what it says there. It says, but the disciples did not understand because they did not understand about the loaves and the fish. No. Something didn't click. It didn't communicate of who Jesus is. No. And that's why they also misunderstand here. They, they, something is blocking them. And we will see that grow as we go on in the gospel. All right. They, they come now with the boat to Gennesaret. Again, we hear about a lot of healings and so forth. That brings chapter 6 to a close. Now, chapter 7 begins again with a preparation for ministry to the Gentiles. This time, it's not going across the sea, but going north to Tyre and Sidon, which is today in the south of Lebanon. Now, but and what Jesus does in that first episode in chapter 7, before they actually go to Tyre, you see, abrogates the boundary markers. <clears throat> Let's look at the story first, then we explain. So Pharisees and some, some scribes from Jerusalem gather around Jesus. And they see that some of his disciples eat with defiled hands. And it explained there with unwashed hands. Because the Pharisees and all the Jews, uh, following the customs of the elders, do not eat without thoroughly washing their hands. And in a similar way, they do not eat anything from the market unless they first thoroughly wash it. Now, uh, and it says they have other such customs too, like the washing of, of, of cups and pots and brass kettles. Now, uh, and so they, 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 they ask Jesus, this, why do your disciples and not follow the customs of the elders. Now, why, why do they eat with defiled hands? And so Jesus once more has to defend his disciples. And he accuses them that they pay more attention to these human traditions, good as they may be, rather than to the commandments of God. And he contrasts it with the commandment to honor your father and your mother. Because they say, if you say to a father and mother, the support you may have had from me is korban, an offering to God, then that person has no more obligation to do anything for a father and mother. And in this way, making void the commandment, which says, honor your father and your mother in, you know, for this human tradition. But then more importantly, Jesus calls the crowd together once more and says to them, uh, you know, pay attention and really understand nothing that goes into a person from the outside can defile the person. What comes from the inside defiles. Now, the disciples also don't understand, and so they ask the same question in the house in private. And then Jesus explains further. He says, everything from the outside uh, that goes inside that you eat enters not the heart. The heart is the center where we create our values, where we give our life direction. So it does not enter the heart, but it enters the stomach, you know, and then comes out in the toilet. So it doesn't defile. And it says there, the evangelist says, in this way, Jesus declared all food as clean. And then he says, it is out of the heart that evil intention comes, murder, adultery, avarice, greed, deceit, uh, 
licentiousness, wickedness, folly, and pride. And he says, all of these come from the within, and all of these define. Now, the argument there I mentioned earlier abounded in market. You know, washing your hands before you eat, washing everything you bring home from the market, etc., washing cups and pots and kettles, and similar things mark you off from the Gentiles. The Gentiles don't do it. Jewish people do. And so by you doing it, you identify yourself as a Jewish person. Uh, another such mark would be the observance of the Sabbath. Another such mark would be circumcision. No, it's, it marks off, it identifies Jewish people. And if they stay in place, you cannot bring Gentiles to become part of God's people because it would mean they would have to become Jews first before they could belong to God. They would have to join, you know, living the way Jewish people do uh, by washing cups and kettles and hands and stuff from the market and so forth. And so Jesus says, uh, abrogates these boundary markers before he goes back to Gentile territory. Okay, so with that, he now leaves for Tyre and Sidon. But he wants to be private. But nevertheless, one Gentile woman hears about it whose daughter has an unclean spirit. She comes and she begs that Jesus would drive the spirit out of her. And now Jesus says, equivalently, my mission is to the Jewish people. Now, because during, uh, in the other Gospels, it's clear that uh, in, in Mark, in Matthew, and in Luke, it's clear that during Jesus' time, his mission was primarily, nearly totally to the Jews. It's only after his resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit that the church, the young church, went out to the Gentiles. Okay, so Jesus says to her, it isn't fair. I mean, he says to her, let the children eat first. Children here would be the Jewish people. Let them eat first. Now, it is not fair to take the food away from the children and throw it to the dogs. Now, dogs here would be a very pejorative way of um, naming pagans. In other words, you take the, the food away from the Israelites and you throw it to those outside, the dogs. Now, the woman isn't turned off. The woman... I, I has an incredible faith in him. She masters this trial, but she answers him and says, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the crumbs of the children's food. Now, in other words, uh, the pets under the table, I mean, share in the food of the children what they drop. And then Jesus says to her, For answering that way, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. And so she goes home. She finds the girl on the bed with the demon gone. Now, this, and the woman is, is a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. Now, this woman becomes an example of discipleship, of a kind of faith and trust in Jesus that nothing that he says could change. And even if you get a rebuke, or get an outright refusal. You don't change your trust in him or your attitude towards him. And so in that sense, she becomes, she has the quality that, that actual disciples who follow them don't have and will never learn, it looks like. Okay. So after that, Jesus sets out again and goes back to the Lake of Galilee, but this time not on the western side. But it says he went by way of uh, uh, Sidon towards the, towards the Sea of Galilee in the territory of the Decapolis. So he comes down on the eastern side of the lake. And first they bring him a deaf man who has a speech defect, which he heals. Now they beg him to lay his hands on him. He does, he heals him and so forth. And then... In the beginning of chapter 8, 
he is again surrounded with the crowd with, without anything to eat. And we now have the feeding of the Gentile part of the community of the Lord. Now, and again, if you read that carefully, it is very similar to the earlier one. And again, he involves the disciples in actually ministering to these people. And so the disciples are trained, but apparently they haven't remembered the earlier one all that well. No, but still, uh, they can tell him how many loaves they have. Uh, they distribute, they get the people to sit down. They, they distribute the food to them. They collect the leftover pieces. So he involves them in caring for the crowd. Now, after that, this time he dismisses the crowd and goes into the boat with the disciples, gets to, to the Jewish side, El Menutha, and is opposed by Pharisees who demand the sign from heaven to test him. But he simply leaves them and gets back into the boat and crosses to the other side towards Bethsaida, which is already on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Now, this crossing to Bethsaida the storm is not on the sea, the storm is in the boat. And we want to look a bit more carefully at, at that particular episode. Now, so the, they sit out in the boat and it says the disciples forgot to bring bread. They only had one loaf with them in the boat. Now, Jesus warned them and said, watch out. Uh, take uh, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees of the Herodians and of Herod and the disciples argue with one another and say it is because we have forgotten to bring bread when Jesus becomes aware of it he says to them why are you arguing about having your bread do you not perceive? Do you not understand? No. Do you have eyes but fail to see? Do you have ears but you do not understand? Are your hearts hardened? And do you not remember? No. And then he says, when I bless the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets of leftover pieces did you pick up? And of course they say 12. And then he says, and when I bless the bread, the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets did you pick up? And they say seven. And he says to them, do you not remember? Do you not? Do you still not understand? And so when we come here, there's a kind of like a, a growing misunderstanding between Jesus and the disciples comes to the fore. They don't understand why Jesus is doing what he's doing, they, 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 don't under, they don't get the meaning of what he does. Uh, they are little, they are actually becoming outsiders because if you go back to chapter 4, verse 11, uh, Jesus says to the disciples and the 12 when they ask him about the parables, he says, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but to those outside, everything comes in parables. That they may indeed see, but not perceive, and indeed hear, but not understand. No? And so he's making that very same accusation against his disciples. Do you have eyes, but you fail to see? Do you have ears, but you fail to understand? And you know, and you know, are your hearts hardened? What has happened to you guys? No, that's that's at the end of the story. So they arrive in Bethsaida, and in Bethsaida they bring to him a blind man and beg him to touch him. So he takes the blind man, brings him out of the village, and he lays his hands on him. Oh, he puts saliva on his eyes and puts his hands on him. And then he asks him, do you see anything? And the man looks up and says, I see people like trees walking. So Jesus lays his hands on him a second time and prays. And then the man looks intently, it says, and sees everything clearly. And uh, so we have here, for the first time in the gospel, a healing of blindness in stages. 
No, the man is partially healed. And, you know, and now he's fully healed. Now, that becomes, in a way, uh, a symbol. It says something about the whole section that follows all the way up to the end, the last episode of chapter 10. In the end of chapter 10, we have the healing of another blind man, namely Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, who is healed completely at once, who is healed and then follows Jesus on his way, now, like a disciple. And so we have two stories of blind people that frame, that enclose a large section of the gospel. And that section of the gospel in between the healing of the two blind men deals with Jesus' attempt to heal the blindness of his disciples, as we shall see in detail. No? And so, and the first one is in stages. And the last episode we're going to take today is Jesus is on the way with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And Caesarea Philippi is as far north as you can go in Palestine. It's very close to where the Jordan originates by Mount Hermon. So it's way up north. And on the way, Jesus says to them, who do people say that I am? And so the disciples say, well, John the Baptist, come to life again, Elijah, uh, or one of the prophets. And then he says to them, and who do you say that I am? And this time Peter speaks up and he says, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus says to them, uh, tells them not to tell anyone uh, about it, about him. And the reason is that when Peter says you are the Messiah, that's also only a partial answer. In other words, the way the disciples answer, Peter included, is similar to the man. They see, but don't see completely. Uh, and we find that out because in the next episode, when Jesus foretells his passion, uh, Peter begins to rebuke him, says, Lord, what are you talking about? It's nonsense. Of course, you're not going to die. You're not going to suffer. You're going to enter into your glory. You're going to begin your royal reign as Messiah. No? And then Jesus rebukes him in turn. So we find out that when Peter says, you're the Messiah, he is right and wrong at the same time. Gives a partial answer. So that's the, 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 the beginning of now entering into that next section, which deals with uh, healing or trying to heal the blindness of the disciples. Okay, so that brings us to the, to the, to the end also of the first part of the Gospel of Mark. Because remember we said that whole first part could be given the heading, who is this man? And if you read it carefully, like say the, the crowd very uh, uh, expresses his amazement, who can this be? The disciples say, who can this be? That even the wind and the waves obey him, you know, and people are filled with awe and so. And that's the first part. And then Jesus himself at the end says, who do you say that I am? Now, one of the most important things that I want to uh, give that as a discussion question for our action groups is, it's at, you know, at, at the end of chapter four, the last one, I said, what is it in the crowd that makes them an outsider? Because they're not really against Jesus. They're amazed. I mean, they're not like the scribes and the Pharisees, and yet they end up as outsiders. And I want to say, at the end of this section, what is it that ultimately makes the disciples outsiders? You know, and what is it in us that we need to watch out for so that we don't, little by little, change from insiders to outsiders? What is Jesus? What is the gospel? What is the story trying to teach us about what it takes to faithfully follow the Lord and remain an insider all the way through and not little by little to drift into this other status?
Okay, that brings us to the end of our session. And I want to thank you for listening. And I pray that as you yourself read through the story and pray with it, that a lot of the things that we discussed so quickly in this session, may the Lord and the Holy Spirit may explain more deeply to you and that the word of God may find a home in your heart become your joy, your strength, your wisdom, and make you effective as an apostle of the Lord in the marketplace. Thank you. Mm -hmm.